let that be our spirit, our stance, our place, that we will exalt you. That you are our God. You are everything to us, Lord. And when we put you in that place, when we put your name in that holy realm where it belongs, Lord, that we exalt you, our spirit starts to sing out. Our ideas and our mindset starts to change because it becomes all about you, God, and what you have for our life. Not our thoughts, not our ideas, not our patterns, not the patterns of this world for sure. But God, that you are our guiding force. You are the one that we exalt. And you are the one that we give our lives to. Lord, we pray that you have your way in this place. Holy Spirit, move in and through each one of us, Lord. Let me be nothing more than your microphone today, Lord. Speak your word. Let us hear your message as we continue through this series, God, learning more about your forgiveness in our lives. So, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you. And the whole church says amen, amen. Well, good morning, One Step. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, it's Super Bowl Sunday. You know, I, I, guess, I guess as a pastor, and many of us should feel blessed that the Super Bowl's in the evening time. Otherwise, I have a feeling Sunday mornings at church would be a little slow on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> so if you're joining us online, it's uh, great to have you with us. We'd love to have you in person if you're in the Miami area. But I'm Pastor Rich. If we've never met before, I have the unbelievable privilege of co-pastoring this church with my beautiful wife, Yoli, and this amazing team. So thank you for joining us. But if you can, love to have you come out and join us in person. For the rest of us, I pray we're all doing well today. Everybody good? Yeah. All right, show of hands. Who's got plans for tonight for the Super Bowl somewhere? Something, anything. Who's doing calorie counting tonight? Good, because otherwise, shame on you. <laughs> Calorie-free Sunday tonight. Look, we're learning about forgiveness. The Lord will understand. Lord, <laughs> you got to love that. Got to love it. So we're continuing today with week two of our series, 70 times 7. 70 times 7, which we learned that is something that Jesus said to the disciples, namely Peter, who we learned about last week. We learned about Peter and the forgiveness that he needed to seek from Jesus, the difference that it made in his life, the, the man it made him to be. After all, go. All right, so, man, I, I love the countdown thing. It brings back my football days. I feel like I should be running drills. So we learned that Peter, as, as he was changed by Jesus, that he messed up, he denied Jesus, he basically betrayed Jesus, yet he is still the man that Jesus said, you are the rock on which I will build my church. I don't know, that speaks to me because it's not that I seek to make mistakes, I just know that I know Rich very well, Rich is going to make mistakes, most of us will in our life, but what a comfort that is to know that I can even mess up and still be used by God. That spoke to me massively. So as we're continuing through this series, if it's your first time joining us online, you can catch up from last week on YouTube. But we're going through this series 70 times 7. Why? Well, forgiveness is massive in our lives. Forgiveness is not only massive because we want to receive it. That's the only way we get saved is because of the forgiveness that God gave to us through Jesus Christ. That he stood in our place and bore our sins so that we could have this. That's the ultimate act of love and forgiveness. And then we can emulate that in our lives by showing forgiveness to others. We talked about that a little last week. It's kind of hard for me to say, God, give me all your forgiveness, but then I hold on to it and I don't share it with anybody else in my life. I don't want to give out forgiveness. I just want to receive forgiveness. So we looked at Jesus last week, and before we get into the individual we're going to be looking at today, I want to go back to our main teaching verses. And if you have your Bibles, they're in Matthew 18. If not, we're going to put them up on the screen and this is where we come up with these 70 times 7. We didn't make it up. It's in the Word of God. And here's what it says. That we're in chapter 18, verse 15 of the book of Matthew. And it reads, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. IRS, if you're watching, especially in tax season, we love you. Jesus loves you. Don't take that in a negative way. But he's like a heathen or a tax collector. All right, jumping down to verse 21. Once again, like we learned last week, love Peter. Peter speaks without thinking most of the time. 
Then Peter, probably wanting to show off for Jesus and the disciples, then Peter came to him, came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? I'm pretty good. What number are we going to throw out here? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. 70 times seven. So the message I want to share today, I've entitled Forgiven and Forever Changed. Forgiven and forever changed. R -r -r Repeat after me, guys. Say, I'm forgiven. I'm, forgiven. I'm, changed. I'm changed. I pray that by the end of this message, those aren't just words that come up our, off our lips, but that's our heart and our spirit. We understand how important it is to know that we are forgiven. And when we are forgiven, even more crucial in our life and our Christian walk is not just we're forgiven. Out of that forgiveness, now we're changed. I think sometimes we push that off to the side, that change through Jesus is more of a, a side piece. You know, it's something we might get to. No, 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 they go together. And we're forgiven, and we're forever changed. Now, I don't know about you guys. I, I know that it's lost its luster over the years, but one of my favorite sporting times of year is coming up, because it's only every four years, and that's the Olympics. The Olympics are coming up. Now, I'm old school. I still like the Olympics. I know over the years there's been commercialization of certain things. There's been controversies with certain things. But at the end of the day, you know what? There's an amazing groups of men and women that dedicate their life to their sport, to their athletics, to their drive, to their purpose. It comes with training. It comes with sacrifice. But it pays off when they can stand on a worldwide stage and represent their country and what it means to them. We're, we're much like that. The, the country we represent in our work, work in our world is heaven. We represent just like that. You know, I, 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 I was never that kind of athlete. You know, I was just more of a casual, played a little football, a little track and field and stuff like that. And I always like staying active and just doing stuff. You know, I'm like most, most, you know, amateur athletes in my mind. I'm much better than I am physically. In my mind, those catches I make on the football field at the park look like something out of the NFL. And then when I see pictures of it afterwards, I won't say what it looks like, but it doesn't look like that. <laughs> but I do have a, a buddy at work. His name's Roland. I met Roland almost 20 years ago. I was a firefighter on, on Engine 9. I was a tailboard guy. I was the guy who rode in the back of the truck and jumped off, grabbed the hose lines, and ran into the buildings. I love that stuff. And Roland comes through as a rookie while I'm the firefighter on that truck. Well, Roland is interesting because Roland is a, an individual that you know, kind of commands respect when he walks in the room. Roland's only about five foot four to five five. Depends on what shoes he's wearing. So, not the tallest guy in the world, but Roland walks into the station at almost five five, and about two hundred eighty five pounds of solid muscle. This guy is a competitive power lifter and bodybuilder. Now, what's interesting is I, I, I still tease him to this day. He actually, we, we actually still work together at the place we're at right now. I still tease him that I remember the first time we went to go out for lunch and we went to Publix. Most of us get a sandwich, maybe a, a, a cup of tea or some water, you know, stuff like that. You've got to stay in shape. Roland looks like that scene of like what you'd call a Jethro lunch. Roland walks into the thing and sets out a box of the Publix chicken wings, like a 20-piece, a full two-liter of soda, a bag of chips, a sandwich, and I'm sitting there going, is, is that all your meals? He goes, no, that's just lunch. This guy's metabolism was so fast, he sweats while he eats lunch. Now, mind you, though, Roland could bench over 600-something pounds. He was a competitive power lifter. Roland embarrassed us one day. You know, we all thought, oh, look at us, we're strong. One of the guys, we're all trying to stay in shape. He gets one of those big tractor tires. It's about yay tall, about yay wide. And we're all sitting in the back showing off. Ah, oh, we're throwing it up, getting all nasty and dirty, about to pop a hernia from what we're trying. And we go, hey, Roland, come on, how strong are you? Go over here. No, 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 he's always humble. No, I'd, I'd have a tough time lifting that. Really? Really? And then he walks over, fine, I'll do it. He walks over, takes a wide stance, reaches down with one arm, picks it up like this, pushes it up like that, and that's when we go, you know what, bro, I love you, but I hate you right now. I love you, but I do not like you right now. But why do I bring up Roland? Well, Roland, depending on what he was doing, had to change his body massively. He would drop from 285 pounds, still solid, to 217 pounds at about 3% body fat. If, if, if any of you have never seen a competitive bodybuilder understand what that goes through, think about that. In a few months, he would drop 70-something pounds off his body frame and look like a completely different person for a whole different purpose. He looked like a new guy, almost looked like a new creation. That's what it's like in our walk with God. You see, we all come into a certain area in our life before we give it to God, looking a certain way, 
maybe being out of shape spiritually, obviously. And then we come to God, and we go through Jesus, and Jesus says, you're forgiven, you're changed. But I never want to look any different than when I started. You know, the worst is, this is, and I'm going to teach you guys this phrase. I'm going to teach it to you. I'm just going to remind you. The worst phrase to use when it comes to God, and it comes to being changed by God, transformed by God, made new by God, these two words, yeah, but, yeah, but. Man, it's awesome to see you give your life to God. The way he's going to change you, yeah, but you don't understand how messed up I am. God's going to make you a new creation. God's going to use you massively. Yeah, but you don't understand what I've done in my past. Yeah, but, yeah, but. These athletes, my buddy Roland, if their lives were led by yeah, buts, they wouldn't be in the place they were. God, don't let your butt be bigger than God's. That doesn't mean anything weird. It's it's weird. Because we always say, but God, but God. So who do we want to look at today when it comes to someone in the Bible who you could look at his past and he could have told God over and over again, yeah, but God, I can't do that. Yeah, but God, I won't do that. Yeah, but God, I'm not changed like that. You can't change me. Well, that's none other than Paul, Paul the Apostle. First, we know him as Saul, not Paul. We know him as Saul of Tarsus. And then we come to know him later on as Paul the Apostle. And we'll get into that in a minute. But the first point I want to look at when it comes to Paul and the forgiveness in his life is, I'm not the person I once was. Now, I wanted to do a little, and, and, and Becky always usually picks up when I throw little song references. I actually put that, I ain't the person I once was, but I changed it. It sounds a little better. I was giving a little shout out to Toby Keith, God rest his soul, Godspeed. I ain't as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. And his, love that song. But I'm not the person I once was. Do we see ourselves like that when it comes to God? Do we really understand the level of forgiveness when it comes to God and what he does for us? I, I would venture to say most of us don't. I know I've had trouble wrapping my, my mind around that sometimes. To truly understand the forgiveness and the change of God that I'm not that person anymore. Well, why do I say Paul? Well, when we first get introduced to Paul, it's in the book of Acts. We get introduced to him as Saul. And let me tell you what, you want to talk about an entrance. Saul's entrance into the world of battling Christianity rivals like a WWE superstar coming into their song. When that wrestler comes into their song, their way, everything stops, everybody stares at them, and that's what's going That's Saul in this world. That's the way Saul attacked the church. It was such ferocity that he tried to destroy the work of Jesus Christ. That was his sole goal. Well, we're going to pick it up. Where do we meet Saul for the first time? Well, you might have even read this and skipped right over it where you actually hear of Saul for the first time. We're jumping into Acts chapter 7. It's going to be all the way down to verse 57. Let's bring it up to date of where we are in the book of Acts. You see, Stephen, one of the followers of Jesus Christ, sat there and was calling out all the religious leaders saying, you have missed the Messiah. You have missed the Christ. You have missed him. You crucified him, you sacrificed him, and you didn't even know it. So what did they do? Well, this is what they did when they had enough of Stephen calling them out and saying all that they were doing wrong from their forefathers in the Old Testament to what they were doing on that day. And picking it up in verse 57, this is the response of these religious leaders and the peoples that Stephen was talking to and preaching to. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Listen. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. The first time we hear of him. Then they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now jumping over to a few verses later, we start up with Acts chapter 8. And the first few verses there, once again, we find out that Saul is having his The clothing laid at his feet. He was a a young leader. And now here he is. They're all throwing their clothes at his feet so they can go stone Stephen to death. That's his first entrance into the Bible for us. Not a very good one, I think. But in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. And what does Saul do after that? As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women 
committing them to prison. That's the first introduction we get to Saul, or we also know as Paul. I, I, I wanted to start off there because most of us know where this is going, I think, when it comes to biblical, as far as the accounts and historical facts. But when we say to everything in God's realm and in the world and Christianity that we harbor and we hold on to all the stuff that we're forgiven of, you think you've done worse than Paul? Paul was literally going out. His purpose was to persecute people in the church, drag out men, women, children, anybody that would profess the name of Jesus, drag them out of their homes to have them bound and thrown in prison. I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm pretty sure that none of us in here have done that. We haven't gone that far. Do you go out? I'm sure there's some people we feel we want to do that to, but we haven't actually done that. Think about that. This is Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Who is Saul of Tarsus? Saul of Tarsus, the reason they were putting their clothes down at him, just a little history lesson. So Saul was a Jewish man born under Roman citizenship. He studied under a Sanhedrin leader. The Sanhedrin was all the leaders of the Jewish uh, religion under Gamaliel. And he studied under him. He was being raised up to be a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was going to be one of the top dogs. That's what Saul of Tarsus was being raised up to be. So he, with all his fervor, was attacking everything that went against what he was taught under all his years and all of his instruction. He was determined that I'm going to destroy things. Most of us want to just live our lives being good people and everything else. But when we ask for forgiveness, we never shed off that extra weight. Imagine my buddy Roland, if he never shed off that extra weight and showed up on stage to compete with all those other guys, not putting in the work, not putting in the change, wanting to still be the exact same person he was, but wanting good results. You get where I'm going with this? We carry and we harbor and we have all this junk that we want to carry around, all these extra bags. We want to carry around all this extra weight because we cannot accept and wrap our minds around the forgiveness of Jesus and what it means in our life. You see, forgiveness is a two-way street, if you will. Forgiveness is given, but forgiveness is not always received. Why is that important in our lives? Well, going back to where Jesus was telling the disciples and the people that you go to your brother, you keep going to him, you keep going to him, you're giving your forgiveness to him. If he doesn't want to accept it at the end of the day, there's nothing more I can do about that. I think a lot of times, and I've learned this in my life personally, I've always felt that, especially as a Christian, we've got to be super sweet to people and we've got to be nice because we have this concept that, well, Christians always got to forgive for things. Yeah, you got to forgive. Your forgiveness, though, is not hinging on that person that's receiving the forgiveness. You offer forgiveness? If they accept it, great. If they don't, move on. A lot of times we don't realize forgiveness means you letting go, you releasing. Sometimes there's the weight of sin we need to let go. There's the guilt. There's everything else. Sometimes it's the weight of certain people in our life. Sometimes there's friends that we got that are holding us back. And then when you come to find out that having them removed from your life might actually be a good thing. I've forgiven them. I'm moving on. I have some people recently that I've been trying to forgive in my life. I've done my part. I've reached out. I've said, yeah, I want to talk. I want to forgive you. It's on them now. If they don't want to come over and say, then I move on. I gave forgiveness. It's not up to you to receive it. That's where, that's where somebody thinks they can hold on to you. They don't. God gives forgiveness to us through Jesus Christ. We have to accept it. The work of God still goes on. The salvation still goes on. Me accepting Jesus Christ doesn't make him any more valid or less valid or anything. He did it. He's done it. I have to receive it. Well, we're going to jump down because we know a lot of times, okay, Saul, Richie, but he didn't stay like that. Come on. This is the guy who penned 13 of the letters in the New Testament. This is the man. This is Paul, the apostle. Well, he had to be changed. He had to receive forgiveness. Well, we're going to jump down to Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. This is the road to Damascus. He's going to the city of Damascus. Now, understand, we're going to set this up a little bit here. Saul is going to the city of Damascus with letters from the leaders of the Jewish religion giving him authority that when I find anybody who speaks the name of Jesus Christ, I'm going to arrest him and drag him all the way back to Jerusalem. That was what he was going to Damascus for. He wasn't going on a vacation. He wasn't going to make friends, that's for sure. He was going to drag people out, continue creating havoc in the church. That's this guy. So in verse 3, it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul responded, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, 
whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Kick against the goads. What the heck are the goads, Rich? Well, the goads is that area behind oxen or horses that holds them together. So you can either kick against it and not get anywhere. You can put your feet to the ground and start walking and do what you're supposed to do. That's what Jesus is telling him. You're kicking against everything. You're kicking against the thing that's supposed to help direct you. Jesus finally had enough. Sometimes I think we forget to paint that picture of God. The God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they get to a point that they have enough of us. They get tired of the whining, the complaining, the treachery, the deceit, the fighting, the kicking against the goads. And eventually they'll say, I've had enough. Now what's funny is Saul's reputation preceded him. You see, he was going to be going to the city of Damascus. Now you can imagine, just put yourself there for a second, you can imagine in the group of disciples and in the church of Christ, you think he was well-liked? You think he was going to be well-received? How often do we feel like in our life that we've upset people, aggravated people, gotten mad at people, and then if I'm ever going to be a part of that group, I have to forgive and receive forgiveness? That's a perfect picture of it. Why? Because in the city of Damascus, there was a young, uh, not a young man, a man named Ananias. God called out to Ananias and said, hey, there's this guy coming. Maybe you heard of him. Saul of Tarsus is coming. I want you to pray over him and fill him with the Holy Spirit. Now, Ananias, of course, like any of us would, said, oh, absolutely, God. So bring him on in. Now, what he actually did was he was like, hold on, time out, God. You do know who that guy is, right? In case you forgot, you know that's Saul of Tarsus, right? He's the same guy that's persecuting your people, including me. He's not coming to the city of Damascus to make friends, God. He's coming to arrest us and take us off. How possibly can I bless him, God? Are you kidding me? You want me to pray over him? That guy? The yeah, but guy? Yeah, but I'm doing my job. What does God tell Ananias? In Acts 9, 15 through 16, he says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. This one, we, we like to skip over this verse very quickly. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Yeah, it's funny. I, I don't think we're going to put that one in the one-step brochure for the serving on team. Please come join one-step team. See how much we're going to suffer for the name of the Lord. I don't know why we haven't had any sign-ups. I'm not understanding. That's what God told Ananias. He didn't necessarily reveal that to Paul at this time or Saul. He didn't tell him that. He told Ananias, I'm going to show him. You just do what I've asked you to do. I've forgiven you, Ananias. Just take my forgiveness and give it to him. That's one of the hardest things for us to wrap around. The forgiveness we give, it's based on what God gave us. That's why we're just nothing more than a conduit. We're something that flows through, like with electricity and time. It flows through. If it doesn't flow back and forth, it doesn't work. Same with us. If the forgiveness of God and that revelation in our life doesn't flow through us back and forth, it has to flow out to the people around us, and it has to flow back to, be, to God to be filled by Him again. Flow back out to the people around us. Back, it, it, it's a conduit. It's a relationship. But we, we don't always grasp that. We always want to say, yeah. Come on. How many times have we done this? Rich? Yeah, yeah God. I, I want you to go out and talk to somebody. Yeah, but do you not remember what they did? Mm -hmm. Rich, I want you to go out and forgive them regardless of whether they forgive you. Yeah, but remember how they hurt me and they upset me? Remember what they did to me? Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. I feel like eventually God's going to say, yeah, but I forgave you. And you've met yourself before, right? You know? We don't want to do that. Well, why? Well, because this is where I want to focus on what we talked about earlier. Point two is new me, new purpose. New me, new purpose. This is the one we have so much trouble wrapping our mind around. That when we become new in Christ, we have a new purpose. You see, it isn't under my own strength and my own understanding that I do the things that I do. None of us do. Once we give our life to God, it makes zero sense to the world around us. Zero. To tell, to tell friends, yeah, so what do you do on your days off? Well, on my days off, I have the blessing to be able to go to school study the Word of God, write messages, lead a church, pray over people, visit people, preach to people. They're looking at that going, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go play golf, and then we're going to go out on the boat, and then we're going to go do this, and we're going to go do that. That's what makes sense to the world. This makes zero sense to the world, but that's okay. 
I'd rather confuse the world and please God. That'll pay off a little bit better in the end. Why? Because I'm a new person. I got a new purpose. Do we understand that? It's the same with Paul. Paul, the man who was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ, going against his name, dragging out men, women, and children. That's the same person we're reading about today. You want to talk about forgiveness? That's a person who knows the forgiveness of God. Because to go from what he did before Jesus to what he did after Jesus, that's not just a little change. That's a complete 180, complete change. Well, where do we see that? Well, Acts 9, 20 through 22. We just talked about the fact that Ananias blessed Paul, or Saul at the time, and said, hey, I want to bless you. You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I love this. Starting in verse 20. Immediately. I don't care what language you put that in. That means ahora, right now, this moment. Immediately. He preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, what, what do they say? Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? The hypocrite, that guy's doing that. I know what you did last week. Don't tell me that I'm doing wrong now. You were in the strip club with me last week. You were drinking with me last week. You did drugs with me last week. You did this with me last week. Now all of a sudden, you're changed immediately. And has come here for that purpose, to drag people away, so that he might bring them bound to the chief of priests. But Saul increased all the more. Did he slow down? Did he feel sorry for himself? Did he feel bad? No. He increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Yes, yes, that man, that guy, that person, immediately. I don't read anywhere in, in the record here, Saul has such a fervor for what he does. I think he was like type A++ personality. This guy goes from head on, I'm going to destroy the church, I'm going to destroy the name of Jesus Christ, I'm going to go against everything they do. And the very same chapter, we're not even talking about a massive change in time. He went to Damascus, he met with Ananias, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and that word immediately, he preached the, the word of God. Immediately. Here's what I'll encourage all of us, and, and don't think I'm going to get all holier than thou, like, oh, that's it, nobody goes through struggles, nobody goes through times. If you ask for forgiveness from God, and you decide to harbor and hold on to all the stuff you've done before, is that his fault or our fault? Whose fault is that? Come on, let's be real. Whose fault is that? Is that his or ours? He says, Rich, I forgive you. You no longer have to be that person. You're a new creation. You're new in me. Go out and do my work. That's up to me now. I can sit there and say every vice in my life holds me. So now I'm telling that vice that it's stronger than God. That's the reality. Now I'm not taking away that there's certain things we can do. There's certain people, certain groups that help us with our journey to become better in Christians and understand God. But never, ever, ever tell God after he saved you that I'm anything other than a son or a daughter of Christ. Nothing. If I tell God, yeah, that's great, you saved me, but I'm still whatever title I want to give myself because of what past life I had. That's basically telling God, you don't really change me. That I'm still identified as that. I'll be straight up. I'm still identified as a drunk, as a drug addict, as a sex addict. I'm, I'm identified as that. No, 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 no. You're, you're a son of Christ. You're a son of God through Jesus. That's great, but I'm this, but I'm that, but I'm... Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. We have to do that. And the change of God will come in our life. Proof's in the pudding. Now, side note here. Side note. Only because I don't want to call it a massive myth in, in the church and something we teach. But there has been a, bit, a little bit of a misunderstanding, so I want to just correct something. Is You know, in the Bible, there's multiple occasions where God changed the name of somebody. You know, Abram became Abraham. Jacob became Israel. Just for our knowledge, Saul did not become Paul. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God changed Saul's name to Paul. That's where we extrapolate that. We pull that out. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Roman name. Simple as that. God never changed that. Well, how do we know? In Acts 13, 9, this is Luke writing, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked at this man intently. He was dealing with an issue in one of the cities. Uh, the name that was used for Saul and Paul was because if he was in a Jewish setting, he would go by Saul. And if he was in a Roman setting, Greek setting, he would go by Paul. I'm not going to get into the details of that. The names don't translate well from one language to another. It's kind of like, 
it's kind of like, you know, obviously a gringo in Miami. I'm definitely the majority in Miami. Um, so, you know, of course, I, everybody, fun, everybody laughs at work. Oh, oh your wife's Cuban? I, I didn't have a choice. I, I live in Miami. Of course my wife's Cuban. I went to Southwest Senior High. I went to Southwest Seto. Of course I got a Cuban wife. Well, one of the first times I'm hanging out with Yoli and we go over to meet with her family. Uh, I, loved, I, loved, I loved her uh, uh, tío. Oh, no, no, no. That's why I started learning. Oh, no, no. We, we call so-and-so gordo. Okay. I'm not a, a scholar here when it comes to English to Spanish, but I'm pretty sure gordo means fat. <laughs> so you call somebody, hey, fatso? It's a term of endearment. No, it's not. Let me try it at home, you know. Hey, Uncle so-and-so, what's up, fatso? Oh, good Lord, have mercy. It doesn't translate in English very well. So it's the same thing here with Saul and Paul. The names didn't translate, but just for knowledge, it was never changed. It was just two different names. So, but that does not mean that God did not massively change Saul. He did not massively use Paul. He did all that. Why? Because Paul let it go. He realized he was a new creation. He was a new purpose. It doesn't sit here in the Bible and say that he even had time to think about it. It's funny, when you look at the writings and understand that the author of Acts is Luke. That's why when you read the book, the Gospel of Luke, and you read Acts, it's a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. He's a physician. He's detailed. He's well-written. He writes with authority. He writes with expertise. Because God used each person individually to write the Gospels and the, and the messages. Luke was so detailed. Nowhere in here, nowhere in here does Luke say that Paul had to sit on it for a few months and pray about it and think about it. He immediately started preaching the word of Christ. Went from this guy to that guy in that moment. Why can't we do that? Because we don't grasp this concept, and I'll finish with this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a what? A new person. The old life is where? It's gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Bringing people back. Reconciling means to mend that relationship. For God was in Christ reconciling what? The entire world to himself. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Now what's awesome is, and you can do this on your own, you look up Bible verses about new creation, new life. There's multiple ones from Old Testament to New Testament. Multiple. I can't give you an exact number. But there's a lot, not just one. This isn't the only place where it says about being a new creation. We're told over and over again in the scriptures that we have new life. We've been forgiven. We've been set free. We've been let go. We have this new creation. I just love that concept, new creation. Well, what's important about being a new creation? Well, who's the one creating? You see, if the world creates us and molds us who we are, we're going to look like the world. If God creates us and molds us, we're going to look like who? God. So if I'm a new creation in God through Jesus Christ, I have no say in what I should look like. God does. And if God says, I've forgiven you, what in the world are you holding on to? What? What are you holding on to that's so much more important and so much more powerful than me? What is it? Please tell me. I'm sure God would love to hear our yeah, but one more time. At least one more time. Yeah, why? So, Rich, why is it that I can't change you? Yoli, why is it I can't change you? Please tell me. What's so powerful in your life that is stronger than I am? That means more to you than I do. Why? Because right there, all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. When he's reconciling us, what does it say? I love that. No longer counting people's sins against them. God's not saying you're going to forget. I never want to forget the harms I did. Why? Because I never want to do them again. My memory doesn't fade me when I think of the things that I've done in the past to hurt people. Whether family, friends, my wife, God. We forget that we hurt God when we do sinful and wrong things. But if God tells me there that he's no longer counting people's sins against them. So, so what you're saying to God is, I've asked for forgiveness. He's given forgiveness. I should let it go? Is that what you're telling me? Absolutely. Absolutely. What is so beautiful about the forgiveness of Paul? I'm not looking at Paul as a massively forgiving guy because after Paul, Paul's like a tirade. He becomes, he creates havoc in the Christian church, turns right around and creates havoc in the Jewish synagogues and churches. 
He's still Paul. He didn't change in that sense. I'm still a loud, outgoing, what's the word, honey? Exhausting guy. I'm just an exhausting guy for God now instead of for myself. I'm going to remind you of that at home. (laughs) Paul's the same way. Paul let it go. Paul said, I'm a new creation. I'm new in Christ. What do you want me to do? You want me to take that same fervor I had for doing wrong, and you want me to do it for right? That's all of us. Whatever we put the same energy in to do wrong against God, once he's forgiven that, don't forget who you are. Now use that same fervor. God made me a certain way. I'm going to use that for him. But I can't do that if I'm carrying the extra baggage of unforgiveness in my life for what God did. That's the beauty of the forgiveness of looking at Paul, is that he had to say, oh, well, have you forgiven me, God? That's not arrogance. I know sometimes in our human thing we say, yeah, but I look like a jerk if I kind of forget everything I did. I said, no, no, you're not forgetting anything you did. But if God's forgiven you, don't harbor it. Let it go. Move on. You got work to do. I always use the analogy when I'm, when I'm counseling with guys, especially guys in the fire department, because we understand this. It's already difficult enough to climb up a ladder. Then you put a couple tools in your hand. It makes it harder. Then you throw on all of our bunker gear, our air pack, our helmet, our boots, and carrying a couple tools up the ladder. I used to love that when I first came to the academy. All right, I, I got my axe and my sledgehammer. Climb the ladder. Where's the third hand? I only got two hands, sir. Get up the ladder. Every single thing made it more difficult. Now add the weight of sin, shame, guilt, bad relationships, bad people in your life hanging off of you as you're trying to climb up that ladder. You decide to put more weight on yourself that makes everything in our life more difficult. You decide to shed that weight off and let it go. Just like my buddy Roland, it puts us in the shape and the place and the way we're supposed to look for the job we have to do at that time. So I encourage each one of us, just like Paul, don't forget who you were, don't forget what you've done. But you don't hold on to what God's already forgiven. That's disrespectful to God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because nothing in our life is beyond his forgiveness. So let's pray, guys. Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you as we continue to go through this series on forgiveness. God, I pray that you not only impart on us the understanding and the gravity and the weight and the beauty and the cost of your forgiveness because yeah it's free to us but it cost everything it cost you giving up your son it cost your son going on a cross it cost him giving his life and bearing the weight of our sins but so that we could be forgiven for anybody who has never heard the gospel whether in person here or online you never heard the gospel you've, you've never received it you never understood it You've never understood that kind of forgiveness in your life. You've only understood the world's forgiveness. That I'll forgive you if you make it worth my while. I'll forgive you if you forgive me. I'll forgive, no. The forgiveness of Jesus was offered with an open hand for anybody who wants to take it. And he even did it for those people that won't receive it. But he still loved them enough to do it. And what is that? That he came down to earth, lived as one of us. That Jesus Christ faced all kinds of trials and temptations, yet lived a life that was sinless not that was easy not that was tempting not that was treacherous it was all that but he did it without sin why? so that he could go to the cross as the perfect unblemished lamb of God to die for each and every one of us but he loved us so much he didn't stay in that grave he rose again three days later his resurrection overcame sin and death his life represents our salvation and that's a offering that he gives to each one of us. What do we have to do? Well, we have to acknowledge that we're sinners. We have to acknowledge that we're separated from God because of sin. And that Jesus Christ is the only, not a, not partially, not a type of, the only way to God. It's a narrow path, but that's okay. When you have the directions, you know how to walk that narrow path. And Jesus Christ offers that to each one of us. All you have to do is receive him, acknowledge that you want his forgiveness, give your life to him, receive his forgiveness, and then await the instructions just like Paul of what he's got next for you to do in your life. For the rest of us, I pray that God continue to impart his love upon us, his strength upon us, his understanding upon us, and that due to his forgiveness, I pray that we learn to forgive ourselves, drop the extra weight of sin, shame, guilt, and everything else, and follow God with what he's got for us. So Lord, please be with us this week. Bless us, strengthen us, and ultimately use us 
wherever we may be, to spread the love of your gospel. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you. And everybody says amen and amen, church. For anybody that made that decision in person or online, we want to put a free Bible in your hand. We have an amazing team over there. If you're watching online, please reach out to us, message us. We'll find a way to put a free Bible in your hand because we want everybody to have the Word of God. For the rest of us, let's hang out. Let's do a pre-Super Bowl party. Let's have fun together, guys. Happy Sunday, everybody.